Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. It's new week. We're continuing reading Thiel's critique of Louis F. Weir and James White. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have each morning to open your word and to study together. We invite your spirit to speak to each one of us. And we are so thankful for the blessings of this past week and the past Sabbath. We just look forward to the work that you are going to do this week. We pray for one another, for our families. We ask for care and protection and help us in the decisions and choices in life that we can follow where you want to lead us. Thank you for your providences and the voice that speaks to us through your spirit. Be with us now. Give us wisdom and understanding and correct us when we are in error. We pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so in dealing with uh, Thiel, what is it that we, what is the main issue that has arisen re about Thiel's view of Lewis F. Weir's understanding? So what have, what have we learned so far? If we were going to sum up what this conflict is that that's not really been laid out by Thiel very well but we we see the conflict in in what we've recently read can anybody sort of sum that up for us so he was saying this if we are had like a, a mystical understanding regarding the interpretation of prophecy okay so so it has to do with two different ways of looking at prophecy of understanding the Bible. So the literal as opposed to what he calls the mystical. So he has a view that the way that we have been studying, the way that we understand scripture, the way we understand prophecy, is that we understand that there's symbols and those symbols need to be interpreted. And there's this conflict um, that that Thiel doesn't, he doesn't seem to be clearly pointing out exactly how he's doing it because he's saying we need to take daniel literally um daniel 11 it's all literal all the way through that's what smith says but we still have this problem that we don't do that with the book of revelation yet if we do it in daniel with the nations we to be consistent wouldn't we have to do that with revelation like it seems to me these two things don't mix when you say all the way through, do you mean all the way through to Daniel end end of twelve? Twelve ninety, thirteen thirty-five. Like except... get a pop. Well, I'm not sure what he means. So so the way that Uriah Smith says is that that Daniel eleven is a literal prophecy, and that's why he's going to take the nations literally. But he doesn't say that specifically, but that's what we would have to assume. Because he's going to have the king of the north being Turkey because Turkey's the king of the north in 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 the literal sense, right? Because they have Syria. And then and then Egypt, of course, is the king of the south because they that's the Ptolemic Empire. And we know that's true with the Greeks. And we know that when Rome conquers northern Greece, right, the Seleucid Empire and, and has Syria, then it becomes the king of the north. Uh, pagan Rome does. It, I mean, it must if you believe that whoever op occupies that ter ter territory becomes the king of the north. But we've understood that the king of the north is also a symbol, right? That's So there's a literal battle over these kings of the north and the kings of the south, and they become symbols that are later applied. That's how we've done it. So Thiel is arguing that that would be mystical, right? That we just need to take that literally. But we don't do that with the book of Revelation, right? Yeah, this paper then it doesn't doesn't deal with Daniel 12. Just he's dealing with Revel Smith's treatment of Daniel 11. Yeah, 11 verse 3 to 45. And a little bit, you know, 12 verse 1, because, you know, he's talking about like the close of probation, you know, when Michael stands up. And so he wants all of these things to occur prior to the close of probation. Right. So he's even though it says when he shall come to his end and none shall help, 
We know that that's after the close of probation. That's talking about what's going to happen to the king of the north later, not what's going to happen to the king of the north before the close of probation. That's how we understand Daniel 11, verse 45. So it's talking about the activities in the Sunday law prior to the close of probation. And then it's going to talk about the end of that power that brings that's dealing with that Sunday law, right? So they're all kind of tied together. We, we don't have to expect Daniel is always going to go perfectly chronological. That is, he doesn't, right? He He's going to repeat and enlarge. He's going to talk about something and then he's going to, you know, talk about the end of it. And then he's going to go back and, and repeat some other details connected repeat to that. It. You know, the repeat and enlarge, not in chronicle order, and so on, back and forth. That's yeah. one of the difficulties I think that people have with uh, interpreting the 1290 and 1335 literally and future, because they, they yes. think it has to be in chronological order. Yeah. Yeah, and, and people run into the same same problems in Revelation. You know, where John's going to talk about. Um, you know, the thousand years and Satan being bound. And then, you know, then it's going to talk about the first resurrection and the second death. And they think that it's somehow just written chronologically where he's, he's dealing with different topics and jumping around a bit. And, and we see this in Genesis, right? The creation of the world of Adam and Eve. And then, so some people say, well, there must be two different creation stories because it's going to talk about everything being finished. And then it's going to go, and talk about the creation of Adam and Eve, right? And but that's just simply repeat and enlarge. I mean, even the first verse of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You know, that's I mean, it's almost like a title. But then he's gonna expand on that, right? He's gonna repeat and mm-hmm. enlarge, and then he's gonna deal with man, right? So mm-hmm. so this is just the way that the Jews write, that's the Hebrew mind of how they unfold a story. And and we see this also even in the Gospels. They're not written in chronological order. Uh, You know, like Luke, which says, you know, and and that's Luke is, of course, not Jewish. But even then, you know, he says, I put these things in order. Well, he's going to group them in topics, not chronologically on how they occurred. So people expect the Bible to be written a certain way. But the problem that, that Theo would be having here is we have uh, symbols in Revelation that we're not going to take literally. We're not, when we see Babylon, we're not going to think Iraq, right? And we know that that Theo's going to argue that there's the king of the north and the beast are not the same power, that the king of the north is this separate power. And yet, you know, in Revelation, I don't think that we could see that there's some separate power as the king of the north unless, you know, he's going to try to say that that's spiritualism or something, right? So that there's all kinds of, and the thing is, we're, we're trying to examine what Theo is saying, you know, fairly. Right? We're not we're not just you know, like tearing him down and and mocking what he's saying, right? We're trying to understand his arguments. But it definitely clashes with what we understand, right? And the question is, can we fit what he says with what we understand the Bible and the spirit of prophecy to say? Is there maybe something wrong with our understanding? If there is, you know, we would have to see clearly how that is. And he hasn't, of course, done a good job explaining his views. So it's it's not a very systematic sort of argument that he's made and mostly from our perspective he's done a lot of guessing about the motives of james white and the motives of uh, lewis f weir which which don't seem to be logical right so he tries to set um lewis f weir at odds with the counsel that ellen white gives right and he gives this quote which we had read uh, from the spirit of prophecy, this quote is from, or is it from, yeah, manuscript releases written June 3rd, 1894 to Little John, right? So talking about these extreme positions. And so he's trying to put Lewis F. Weir in what Ellen White is writing counsel against, right? 
Let God by inspiration trace the errors of his people for their instruction and admonition, but let not finite lips or pens dwell upon those features of the experience of God's people that will ha have a tendency to confuse and cloud the mind. Let no one call attention to the errors of those whose general work had been accepted of God. So he's going to say, mm. well, Louis F. Weir is attacking Smith. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I'm, have we seen Louis F. Weir attack Smith? No. Basically looking at his ideas. Yeah, yeah just, just the ideas. Ideas contradictory or whatever. Yeah. Um, Has, I, I, what, I'm interested... Go, go. I'm interested to uh, to to know a little bit more about David Thiel, his background, or is he an academic? Um, why He's not he, an academic. So is he just a, a a church member who writes stuff? Then, well, as far as I know, this is the only thing he's written. But I I haven't seen anything else. I'm just friends with him on Facebook, and he had this published on Amazing Discoveries. Okay. Right. So, yeah. so that's that's what we have. So, I mean, he's probably written other things, I would assume, but he's definitely not an academic, you know, because his writing isn't at, you know, university level or anything. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what I was wondering. Is he some sort of sort of person in the universities or something? So he's not. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, he's. You know, but he has a view and idea which which we've run into uh, with other people, and and he's the only one I know that's really directly tried to attack Lewis F. Weir. So I I don't generally I mean I, I don't think I've ever seen another article where somebody tries to attack Lewis F. Weir, and and his basic thesis seems to be that Lewis F. Weir is the one that opened this whole can of worms of why we have so many different interpretations of the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation, which which I don't see that there's a basis for that. I don't see that Weir's principles lead to all of the craziness that we see, you know, in people like Roy Allen Anderson, for instance. I mean, the route to that would go more to people like W.W. Um, w. Prescott. So there's quite a different tack that he's taking. On w. w. Prescott being the roots of sort of the seeds of it. Yeah. yeah, well, that that movement that Prescott was a part of, right? Yeah. You know, we would have uh, um, A. G. Daniels exactly. and others as well as part of that. Yeah. So the sort of where we see the new theology coming from is from, and and we're seeing that in Friday nights that he's dealing with the uh, meetings with the evangelicals. That's still just. A part of that. So it was this appeal to Protestant, like wanting to be accepted by the Protestants, um, wanting to go into their schools and get uh, accreditation and all of these things to be recognized so that somehow if we were recognized as equals, as peers with the scholars of the Protestant churches, that we would be able to reach the Protestants that way. Because when we're labeled a cult, then, you know, we're not going to have any influence with these leaders. So that that was the approach that the the leadership of the Adventist Church wanted was wanting to be recognized in some way. And so, I'm, I'm, cu I'm curious, did that something like that happen with the Jews at all, with with Rome or any of their any of the yes. kingdoms? Of yes. Yes. So uh, the way that. Um, um, Alfred Edersheim addresses it in his book because uh, Alfred Edersheim was a Jew who became a Christian and one of the great uh, scholars of the, the 19th century, Christian scholars. And he wrote a book called uh, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, the Temple Ministry and its Service. Uh, he does a history of the Old Testament and uh, another book on the Jewish social life. But anyway, in his, his book, uh, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, which Ellen White had read, one of the books that she supposedly copied, which she didn't because she has quite a few different views uh, than him. But but anyway, he addresses what happened with the Jews in regarding their the influence of Greek thought upon the Jews. And he says it wasn't so much that they just accepted Greek thought, but because it was all around them, that they they 
in order not to to feel I mean, I'm, I'm sort of really paraphrasing it, but the idea of not to appear ignorant, you become influenced by the intellectual environment around you. That's really a paraphrase, but he's, he says it in a much longer way. Um, mm-hmm. And so. So, yeah, there like is a pervasive principle. Yeah. So so we have those influences around us because people want to be accepted and not just necessarily accepted, but even within themselves to not, you know, because there's such this this intellectual environment that somehow, well, I'm not stupid. You know, I'm I'm just as good as them sort of thing. Right. Even even if you're not looking for their actual acceptance, your, there's your sort of personal view of yourself in comparison to these people that you, you know, in some ways admire, even if you disagree with them. Right. So you enter onto their ground. And, and so that happens within Christianity that that to me has been the thing that I recognized as a child reading my grandfather's library and seeing the progression of the rejection of the Bible. You know, first the Genesis story, et cetera, et cetera, as they moved all the way up to, you know, the New Testament in that, um, you know, there is this environment that, that influences you and you want to you want to be accepted in some way within that, whether even if it's just personally. And so the adaption or the adoption of the worldly way of thinking definitely influences uh, us. Right. And so. Hmm. From yeah, an early age, with, what's that? With, may I interrupt you? I don't know. You're probably on a thought train there, but yeah. So, so it, you're bringing to mind something that I'm trying to trying to figure out myself is mm-hmm. so a change in the way I'm approaching God's God's laws requirement. So I'm thinking about it, and I'm thinking <clears throat> that. Um, be, because it's the right thing. Um, trying to do it because I have to have to do the right thing. It's changing for me in that um, I want to do it because of God to to honor Him before others instead of just trying to look right. Mm-hmm. I want to be right. Does that yeah. make any difference yeah. or sense? Yeah. 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 It, it, it brings it home to my heart so that <clears throat> my heart and soul is in it, not just my mind, which makes it much easier because God does the work in me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to do well because white, it is right. White, white, white knuckling righteousness, I call it. <laughs> Yeah, it, I mean, the part of the problem that we have is we we all come with a certain understanding, a certain perspective. And God is trying to, because we're taught in the world, right, all kinds of things, principles that we, we never question. And, you know, I have the, in God's providence, had an experience uh, with my dad and with my grandfather's library that helped me understand the world around me. And that is, I recognized that people were were compromising for a particular reason. That is, people want to look good, right? Not just be good. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's uncomfortable to stand out to the crowd. Right. Now, of course, I also have some other, you know, intellectual problems in, in, in the way that, that I work. Like I'm not necessarily a social person. And so, um, you know, so these are some disadvantages, but they also have been advantages in the sense that I've been able, when I became an Adventist, I never bought into the social environment of Adventism. I wasn't a social or cultural Adventist in any way. I didn't join a group because, you know, I liked being around Adventists or something like that. I didn't particularly like going to church or being around people. Um, That was very uncomfortable. But I knew 
that when I looked at Adventists, I could see what they were doing. And I could see that they didn't like being considered a cult, right? And they wanted to be accepted. And I could see that this was a real problem with Adventism. And so quite an, quite an insight. Yeah. Some, well, someone but it's, but it's, but it's in, God, it's in God's providence. It's in God's providence of just how I was raised and, and my experience. Right. So when we, when I, when I first became an Adventist, as I said, I had the first book I read after being baptized was kingdom of the cults by Walter Mark. And, and so I knew about the evangelical conference. So that's probably not study that we've been studying. And so I understood the motives of why that happened. And so we can see that this type of influence, this to me is where the new theology comes from. Thiel is arguing that the new theology comes from Lewis F. Weir, right? And it comes from the fact that because Smith, so there's two factors. Smith was wrong, apparently, that Turkey was going to make Jerusalem its capital. And so, so Lewis F. Weir has this doubt because he doesn't have faith. And so he has to find some new interpretation, new hermeneutic, in order to explain the failure of Smith's prediction. And then he also has this personal vendetta because of hurt feelings to somehow support James White at the expense of Uriah Smith, which makes no sense to me as a motivation. I'm not, I'm not sure how I even understand that that leap that Lewis F. Weir's feelings was hurt, so he's going to support James White but attack Uriah Smith. I mean, how does the hurt that came from, and even if it was a hurt, whether he felt personally hurt or not, we don't know. But if Lewis F. Weir was mistreated by the church, I'm not sure how that would be have anything to do with Uriah Smith opposing him and supporting James White. Plus, we don't see a personal attack against Uriah Smith by Lewis F. Weir. He's not attacking Smith's character. He's just he's just disagreeing with his logic, with his with how he has interpreted the scriptures, believing that they don't follow the correct principles of biblical interpretation. Lewis F. Weir is seem, not, what's that? It would seem a projection of a uh, steel projection projecting the on Weir, how he's feeling, like he expressed to you that he feels like they're attacking him. Right. So now, that's the way he thinks Weir is operating. Right. So, so when I disagreed with Thiel, so when I when I communicated with Thiel about this, I just asked, "Do you agree with this this paper that you wrote? Like, do you still think the same way? Because it's you know 2018." Um, that when it's when it's published and, uh, you know, he says, oh, of course. Right. And, and and I hardly said anything to him. And right away he 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 attacked me. Right. I mean, he, he says that you're 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 um, you know, you're close minded, you're you're biased, you know, all, all of these different things. And that I was he said I was attacking him, which I, I didn't make any attack of him at all. I just told him what I thought. Um, about Weir, right? That I agreed with Weir. And so there was no attack on him and no, like he says, you th- seem to think you're infallible. I'm like, obviously, I don't think I'm infallible, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So, so I found that kind of odd. So the response that he had right away was very, very defensive, even when there was nothing that I had written that would make him defensive. Now, of course, part of that could be that he's, been attacked by lots of peoples for his views. And so he's just sort of setting up the defenses, uh, expecting an attack or something. But I find that people generally tend to see in others the things that they themselves are struggling with. So the fact that he reads into Lewis F. Weir, that bitterness is going to cause him to take a certain position. Maybe it's the case with Thiel, right? But we don't know. We we can't read people's minds. We don't know why they do what they do. We don't understand fully their perceptions. And and so we we try to take this more dispassionate look at his arguments. But the arguments, which he hasn't laid out well, but the argument basically is we can't use this 
hermeneutic of, of, of Weir's because it contradicts Miller's rules. But he hasn't shown where it contradicts Miller's rules. He's just labeled it as mystical, right? That it's a mystical interpretation that opens the door for all kinds of interpretations. Where when I look at Thiel, I actually see much more a constraint within his principles that that guides us. Um, that it doesn't open the door for what you see with Roy Allen Anderson and, and all these other people. I can't think of all the names of different people who have um, done these different types, you know, Arthur White and, and people like that. You know, they 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 have and, and all of the new theology that's come out, but especially in the area of prophecy, the rejection of, of for instance, um, Revelation 9 is applying to Islam, right? And trying to put the trumpets into the future, things like that. Weir does not do that. And, and so when I look at Weir, I see something that, that supports the pioneer understanding. The only place that he really deviates from Smith is in those verses of Daniel 11, verse 36 to 45, which when we examined, we could see why Smith was incorrect. We Lots of problems with what Smith is saying. And, and especially when we look at the fact that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Ellen White applies that to Daniel chapter 11, right? And, and even the whole view of the daily, like the taking away of the daily, the setting up of the abomination, of desolation. I mean, if you believe in the pioneer view of the daily, it all fits together nicely. That's a major one, isn't it? Yeah. Now we 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 would assume that Thiel is also going to believe the pioneer view of the daily because Smith does, right? But does he understand it? Now the thing that Smith didn't understand was the twenty five twenty, the two twelve sixties, the prophetic mirror. And that's one of the, the mistakes that Smith makes in understanding and interpreting Daniel's last vision. So obviously Thiel isn't going to take that position. He doesn't believe in 2520 because he believes Smith's book is inspired of God. And then he's trying to argue that Ellen White's statements here regarding, you know, attacking the people who have given us this light, that that's what Lewis F. Weir is doing. And yet, James White is also one of these pioneers, and Thiel is attacking James White, right? No, not just at right. saying that he disagrees with James White, but saying James White, you know, he had a stroke, and 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 so, um, and and you know, so he's he's not addressing the theological problem primarily. Mostly, he's addressing the character. Right. The reasons why these people got it wrong, but he's he's not really addressing the arguments. He's not doing a biblical study. He's here and there. He brings in some ideas. So to us, this is an important topic because are we correct in how we interpret prophecy? And and definitely Smith takes a more literal tack on on these verses. But Smith doesn't do that in the book of revelation. So can, can you reconcile this? And, and I don't think that we can, I don't think we can reconcile the Thiel's ideas with what we understand in this movement. Obviously we believe Daniel 11 verse 40 a and 40 B or 1798 and 1989. And that there's just two powers there, the King of the North against the King of the South. I, so, I agree with what you're saying that we can't reconcile it. I'm wondering how much longer will we be enduring with this study? When will we be moving on? From from how much from longer is there? This study much. of seal seal's paper, yeah. Well, we we, um, we just got. We'll probably be done uh, today or tomorrow. I'm I'm thankful to hear that. <laughs> I mean, it's been it's, it's been a good exercise in understanding, uh, trying to understand someone and, and recognizing error in contrast to truth but 
Yeah, well, we're also examining our ourselves. Yeah, I, I get it. Right? Because yeah. you know, the question is, do we really understand what we think, and and how are we communicating? How how have we dealt with with disagreements with others? Right. I mean, that to me is the most enlightening thing about this paper is how we're looking at at how it applies to us. Well, amen. So the question are are we doing these things? Have we done this? in our disagreements with others? Have we attacked people's characters? So we we need to examine that. And we also are looking, we have to look fairly at opposition, like Thiel's paper, to what we believe. We have to evaluate it in the light of Ellen White's counsel. We give a fair hearing. I am having a an intense course in that in the last months. It's very good to examine my own self when uh, you know in disagreement with others and to be able to be to really listen to what they're saying to try to understand what they're saying to listen before answering mm-hmm. and it's been very good just in terms of general relationships and mm-hmm. being able to reach each other because people sense when they're being heard and they sense when you're just trying to argue yeah. And and here we have some counsel, which he, he lays out that he doesn't appear to be following. Right. And he accuses Lewis F. We are not following this counsel. So can it be said that Lewis, we are following this counsel when we as a people scatter instead of gathering where Christ has gathered? It may well be said of us that we are insubordinate. It is not because Smith was wrong in his interpretation that the second coming of Christ was delayed. Ellen White wrote that the prophecies of Daniel chapter 11 had nearly reached their fulfillment. She she describes the response of the wicked to God's merciful grace. She writes of how we are to work for the good of the unrepentant. As in the days that were before the flood, the impenitent see no cause for alarm. They eat, they drink, they marry, and are given in marriage. The event had been long foretold, but time had passed on, and many distinctly say, my Lord delayeth his coming. It is because the work has not been done for the wicked that time delays. God's long forbearance is wonderful. The master is treated with disrespect. He receives but little thanksgiving for his bestowing bestowment of blessings. The world is mad. They do not consider that his long forbearance toward the wicked is part of his great plan. The judgments will surely come, but the long-suffering God will do his work. He will discriminate with justice and accuracy. Let not human pride hurt your record. Do not you suppose the Lord sees and is acquainted with the favorable and unfavorable presentations? Has not the Lord an oversight over his own work? You may suppose, my brethren, that you have to do all the devising, all the strengthening, and all the organizing. And I ask you, is it not best to show you that you have confidence in God? Is it not best to consider that God is manager but he is director you must not be anxious to develop too fast the hand of providence is holding the machinery when that hand starts the wheel then all things will begin to move how can finite man carry the burdens of responsibility for this time his people have been far behind human agencies under the divine planning may recover something of what is lost because the people who had great light did not have corresponding piety, sanctification, and zeal in working out God's specified plans. They have lost to their own disadvantage what they might have gained to the advancement of truth if they had carried out the plans and will of God. Man cannot possibly stretch over the gulf that has been made by the workers who have not been following the divine leader. We may have to remain here in this world because of insubordination many more years, as did the children of Israel. But for Christ's sake, his people should not add sin to sin by charging God with the consequence of their own wrong course of action. Now have men who claim to believe the word of God learned their lesson that obedience is better than sacrifice? He has showed thee, this rebellious people, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Now the Lord will not be pleased with those men whom he hath appointed to do a certain work, 
to take on many lines of work and carry them until they become so wearisome that it breaks their strength. You, nor any other um, agency, cannot heal the hurt that has come to God's people by neglect to lift up his standard and occupy new territory. The churches should now be acting in their strength with capabilities, talents, and means, carrying the work, reaching higher and, and broader in capacity to stand before the world in the power of invincible truth. But if all now would only see and confess and repent their own course of action in departing from the truth of God and following human devising, then the Lord would pardon. Warnings have been coming, but they have been unheeded. But a few who may now seek to bridge the gulf that stands so offensively before God must make haste slowly, else the standard bearers will fail, and who will take their place? Soon grievous troubles will arise among the nations, trouble that will not cease until Jesus comes. As never before, we need to press together, serving him who has prepared his throne in the heavens and whose kingdom ruleth over all. God has not forsaken his people, and our strength lies not in forsaking him. The judgments of God are in the land, the wars and rumor, rumors of wars, the destruction by flood and fire, the fire and flood, say clearly the time that the time of trouble, which is to increase until the end, is very near at hand, and we have no time to lose. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecies of the 11th of Daniel have almost reached their final fulfillment. But who reads the warnings given by the fast fulfilling signs of the times? What impression is made upon worldlings? What change is seen in their attitude? No more than was seen in the attitude of the inhabitants of the Noachian world. Absorbed in worldly business and pleasure, the antediluvians knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Matthew 24, 39. They had heaven sent warnings, but they refused to listen. And today the world utterly regardless of the warning voice of God, is hurrying on to eternal ruin. Now, there's, these are all taken from different places in the spirit of prophecy. Hold on, I've got to, I've got to say this. Yeah. Uh, if you could back up, find a, where it says, having great light, but not matching it with personal piety, and so that's where the problem lies. So just read that line Human agencies under the divine planning may recover something of what is lost because the people who had great light did not have corresponding piety, sanctification, and zeal in working out God's specified plans. So that sums up what I was trying to say about the difference between trying to keep the law versus wanting to keep the law mm -hmm. or honor God. It's because I've had great light. My pretty much my whole life since I was a teenager coming into the church. And the difference I'm finding now is it's that, that, that sanctification in my life that, that I plead with tears for people, for the loss we, that I run into. You know, um, so, and that's giving power to it that I don't even have to try. I, I think back and how I've, Try to sneak in a book or a, edge it into a conversation uh, to tell people about God. And I don't need to do that anymore as much as they're curious. They want to know what's different about you. They, they mm -hmm. want to know. And, and it's not me. I'll tell you. Yeah. It's just, it's just not me. It's, it's so wonderful. I believe yeah. that each of us will, will have that experience. We, we need it. And then, and then that great light that we're being blessed with, that will give, empower the message, our personal experience. It's undeniable. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of these platitudes which, um, you know, people say it, but they don't really know what it means, you know, to let go and let God, right? Because there's, the, you know, it can be interpreted in different ways. But in reality, all of us, have not the corresponding piety, sanctification, and zeal that we profess to have, right? Because the light that's given to us, we have not shared it. And and the whole thing here is that it, it's not going to be just a few workers that can 
can undo what's been done, right? God has to, in, in a sense, take the work into his own hands, right? Because because of this insubordination, we're, we've been here for a lot longer than we need to be. But But God is still going to work. And where it begins is not for us trying to make up others' failures, but for us to recognize our own failures. Or even trying to make up our own failures, well, recognizing where we failed and then just working on Yes, it. because if if each person, you know, sees this, and we also need to press together, right? So this is not about, you know, pulling away from others, right? The big mistake of this movement has always been, instead of seeking to help people that differ with us, differ from us or that that we see as having problems we just cast them off right as if as if they are the problem when in reality we are the problem right and and that's my experience going to church i don't you know i attending church like walk walking in to, to it's a small congregation of about 20 people renting a church and I walked in at five minutes to 12. It's the best I could do at the time, and, but I was going. And uh, I walked in carrying a Walmart bag and, you know, dressed in shorts because I didn't bring dress pants and runners. And like, who is this guy? Did he come, just come from Walmart? What's he doing at church? Well, the Walmart bag is so I could carry things that I needed. But uh, it was uh, just such a good experience. And then the people... When they when I talked to them, I was totally telling them, yeah, you know, I was in church for twenty years or forty years, and and uh, I'm at the addictions treatment center, and I'm doing this and that, and you know they <clears throat> they were really nice and gracious and kind people. I'm looking forward to going back there again, but that experience of just the last five minutes, you know, walking in, I just had to be there. So I'm, I'm going there, you know, for me, of course, to be blessed. I am so greatly blessed by being there, but I'm, it's, I, I think it's, I think there are people there that want what we have, you know, this light, but they won't receive it if I go there trying to tell them. They have to see a difference in what that I have. Mm-hmm. No, and, <sighs> I mean, we've we've talked about this a lot, you know, but this is not about, you know, attacking other people or proving ourselves that we're right. It is re- about reflecting Christ's character so that people will be drawn to Christ. That's why we study the scriptures so that we can be changed. Now, we're going to look again at feel what he says about these statements. So he says, so why have we been wandering around in the wilderness all these years or held in captivity as was Daniel? It is because of the unbelief and indolence of God's people that God is in control. He will accomplish his purpose for his glory alone. And then we have this quote from Ellen White. The Lord has allowed matters in our day to come to a crisis in the exaltation of error above truth, that he, the God of Israel, might work mightily for the greater elevation of his truth in proportion as error is exalted. So then Theo says, what should we do to rectify our wanderings and come out of captivity? Would it not benefit us to return to the counsel of the spirit of prophecy and hold fast to the truth? What is it that Ellen White's counseled us to do regarding the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation? So we're going to have some more spirit of prophecy quotes. God desires the light found in the books of Daniel and Revelation to be presented in clear lines. It is painful to think of the many cheap theories picked up and presented to the people by ignorant, unprepared teachers, those who present their human tests and the nonsensical ideas they have concocted in their own minds show the character of the goods in their treasure house. They have laid in store shoddy material. Their great desire is to make a sensation. This is social media, right? We see it everywhere. And we see it within Adventism, right? We've seen it within this movement as well. Uh, The truth for this time has been brought out in many books. Let those who have been dealing in cheap sentiments and foolish tests cease this work and study Daniel and Revelation by your eyes, Smith. 
They will then have something to talk about that will help the mind. As they receive the knowledge contained in this book, they will have in the treasure house of the mind a store from which they continually draw as they communicate to others the great essential truths of God's word. The interest in Daniel and Revelation is to continue as long as probationary time shall last. God used the author of this book as a channel through which to communicate light to direct minds to the truth. Shall we not appreciate this light, which points us to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our King? Young men, take up the work of canvassing for Daniel and Revelation. Do all you possibly can to sell this book. Enter upon the work with as much earnestness as if you were, as if it were a new book. And remember that as you canvass for it, you are to become familiar with the truths it contains. As you ponder these truths, you will receive ideas that will enable you only to receive light. That you will receive ideas that will enable you not only to receive light, but to let light shine forth to others in clear, bright rays. Now is come the time of the revelation of the grace of God. Now is the gospel of Jesus Christ to be proclaimed. Satan will seek to divert the minds of those who should be established, strengthened, and settled in the truths of the first, second, and third angels' messages. The students in our schools uh, should carefully study Daniel and Revelation so that they shall not be left in darkness and the day of Christ overtake them as a thief in the night. I speak of this book because it is a means of educating those who need to understand the truth of the word. This book should be highly appreciated. It covers much of the ground we have been over in our experience. If the youth will study this book and learn for themselves what is truth, they will be saved from many perils. Now, when Lewis Weir wrote his articles on futurism in 1931, the editors of the Signs of the Times Australia placed this advertisement in connection with the sixth article. No, the book Daniel and Revelation by Pastor Uri Smith and Our Day in the Light of Prophecy by W.A. Spicer. That's the, Our Day in the Light of Prophecy is the book my grandma had uh, in her library. Um, so she must have got it from an Adventist at some time or other. And that's the one that talks about uh, the League of Nations. Anyway. Could it have been when, could it have been when the uh, Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories? Or no, these are earlier. Bible this stories? Is, these are 1920s, our day in no, the life. I'm thinking, uh, did she get it from? No, where she got it in the 1920s. 1920s. Okay. Wow. Yeah, my, my grandmother, right, in Rochester. So her, probably her parents had got it. But she, she anyway had this book, which I read at my grandma's after I'd become an Adventist, um, are without rivals in dealing with prophecies fulfilled and fulfilling. A smaller work, The Papacy and Prophecy by J.A. Stevens, will show how wonderfully the papacy is fulfilled or is fulfilling all the specifications of Antichrist. These may all be obtained from the publishers of this journal. So, so Louis F. Rier had written these, what he calls Futurism. 1931, um, and uh, he's just saying this ad was there in connection with the sixth article. Perhaps it is time that Daniel and Revelation was once again considered to be without rivals by our church leadership and scholars, given the ringing endorsement of Ellen White and our church leaders prior to 1944. Perhaps it is time that the 1944 edition be set aside and the book be restored with all the information pertaining to the Ottoman Empire, and even include those current events that point to fulfillment in the near future. Now, so the question here is one of, we know that Ellen White endorses the book, and, and we're, we're going to be looking on, on a Friday night on another endorsement she made, which is of um, the endorsement of uh, Crozier's article on, on, uh, on Christ sanctuary ministry right so Croz the crozier article was also endorsed the question is when ellen white endorses something does she mean every detail is correct so when we look at uriah smith he's presenting basically the pioneer view now he has some predictions regarding turkey which we don't believe to be correct what Thiel is saying, because Ellen White endorses the book, those must also be correct. And, and I don't believe that that's the case. I believe 
The book Daniel and Revelation is a good book. Definitely um, a lot better than the books that are written today on Daniel and Revelation. So I would I would agree with Ellen White. But do we take this endorsement as that the book is infallible? And and also that God used Smith, right? So we can see that God can use people, but people can still have mistakes in their understanding. Okay. In conclusion, we have discovered a potential reason for Lewis's Weir's attempt to vindicate James White's position on the King of the North and his harshness in dealing with Uriah Smith's position, right? Which I don't really see, but anyway. Injustice plants the seeds of bitterness. So he says, because he's bitter, because of injustice. I, I still don't follow the logic in that. Why he would be against Smith, but support James White. How that is connected, I don't know. Lengthy delay in the fulfillment of prophecy breeds unbelief and skepticism in predicted outcomes. Such doubt can only drive the desperate to contrive a new method of hermeneutics that only add to the confusion by reason of its apparent plausibility. James White is not vindicated in his position merely because the majority of scholars and church leaders now appear to hold his view. And that's true. Reproved by the Lord, according to his son, William White, for bringing distrust and disunity at a time when the church was supposed to press together, James White sank down in discouragement because of the financial burdens that were not being met at a time of apparent fanaticism. Ellen White never endorsed James White's position of the Glorious Mountain being the United States of America, and she did endorse the hermeneutic system of William Miller, which Uriah Smith also used. The colliery position is that people presenting the three angels' messages, as well as the Lord's, as, la, as well as the loud cry, will not adopt any other hermeneutic system than what Miller, William Miller used. Lastly, we need to be selling Daniel and Revelation as though it were a new book, not the 1944 edition with all its deletions of thousands of words pertaining to the Ottoman Empire and the religion of Islam, but an edition that retains those statements, as well as the updates. As, as updates the current events that point to the fulfillment of Daniel 11, verse 45. May God help us repent of our pride, help us to actively and intentionally seek to acquire the characteristics and temperament of Christ's character, and to advance in the truth as it is in Jesus, who is the ultimate fulfillment of prophecy. So, so I think, you know, in, in evaluating what, what Theo has said, it seems to me that... Uh, he's not really stated his case well. Yeah. He uh, also made mention of the 11th of Daniel, uh, where El White says almost has reached its fulfillment. Yeah. Now, if he had read that carefully, that section, yeah, he would have seen that she was writing that in the context of. Um, Verses 30 to 36 repeating. Yeah. In that context. So yeah, that seems to have gone over his head. Yes. Um, yeah. So Ellen White, she, she's writing that around the 1900s. It could be that when she's kind of mentioning the Eastern question back in the 1870s, that that, that was well received, that you know, she's, she maybe not didn't have the light on Daniel 11, there, you know, with the, the latter part at that time. And that was maybe given to her by the other time, the 1960s, or sorry, 1906 period, or whatever it was, when she talked yeah. about the 11th of Daniel. But she didn't really mention the 11th of Daniel uh, much sure. in her uh, write, writings at all up until that time. So it was maybe God had held, held Ellen White from. Uh, expressing any sort of hint of what that prophecy was about until the 1900s? Well, yeah, so, you know, time time keeps moving on and things start to unfold, right? Okay, so we're going to look at this Eastern question thing. There's uh, not a lot in, in, I guess there's three statements in the spirit of prophecy, but um, it looks like they're all the same statement. So this is what she says about the Eastern question, as far as just directly. So it's in Life Sketches, it's in Fourth Testimonies, it's in the Review and Herald, but it, 
looks like it's exactly the same statement. So there's one statement. <clears throat> so this is a, uh, a camp meeting, right? In Groveland, Massachusetts. There were 47 tents on the ground beside three large tents and one of the congregation, one for the congregation being 80 times 125 feet in dimensions. The meetings on the Sabbath were of the deepest interest. The church was revived and strengthened while sinners and backsliders were aroused to a sense of their danger. Sunday morning boats and trains poured their living freight upon the ground in thousands. Elder Smith spoke in the morning upon the Eastern question. The subject was of special interest and the people listened with most earnest attention. In the afternoon, it was difficult to make my way to the desk, etc. So is this an endorsement of the Eastern question and everything that Elder Smith is saying? It's just stating what happened that particular day. She's not giving any sort of endorsement to it or anything against it either way. Maybe she hadn't any opinion. She hadn't any light on that at that year time. And it was not going to be until the 1900s where she could sort of say, or at least give the indication that the verses 30 to 36 is relating to the history that's going to be repeated in verses 40 to 45. Yeah, and, and it's, now when you say Ellen White has, doesn't have light on something, I mean, obviously light unfolds as time moves on, right? Now, sometimes people will use that, well, Ellen White didn't understand, let's say, feast keeping, because God didn't give her light on that, but now we're supposed to keep the feasts. Um, you know, people use that, or she didn't understand the lunar Sabbaths. Right. God didn't give her light, but this is the new light. But one thing we know about new light is it never contradicts old light. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's nothing about our understanding of the repeat of Daniel 11 that would contradict old light. Now, a person could argue, well, the pioneers understood, you know, that um, from verse 36 onward that it was. Uh, referring to Turkey or, or to France, and then you're going to have France fighting against Turkey and Egypt, right? Except that that's not a pioneer position. Josiah Litch held that position. It wasn't the position of William Miller, who was a pioneer. So there are issues that the movement did not have light on prior to the disappointment, right? There are, there are points... Even yeah. Even but, Uriah Smith was supporting the concept that the King of the North was the papacy back in the early 1860s, around 1862. So it was yeah. only afterwards that he, he then went back to the understanding that it related to uh, the Turkey being the King of the North. Well, yeah. That would be interesting to have that uh, handy, Stephen, uh, if you could find that and share it. Yeah, I, I made a uh, I made a comment on the Seventh Day Press our, our um, website concerning that, and they and they wrote back to me saying, "Well, that was before the church formed in 1863, so it doesn't count, basically." <laughs> How convenient. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so well, it wasn't it wasn't, it wasn't a church position, you know. Now, when, when we type in the Eastern question in quotation marks in the pioneer authors, uh, we're going to get um, 364 hits, uh, right? So obviously, I'm not going to look at all of them. Um, but here, here's just something from A.T. Jones uh, dealing with uh, the book of Revelation. So this is something we, we are going to look at some Lewis F. Weir as well, right? So... But here is what here's what A.T. Jones is saying in I'm not sure what year this is. It looks like 1898. Uh, Until this present season, the United States stood here away in the extreme west in a splendid isolation from all the nations and kings of the east, unconnected with their national interests, unconcerned with their national affairs. Now, however, this is no longer so. The present season of 1898. The splendid isolation of this great nation has been swept away, and this nation has become one of the world powers. The extreme western 
uh, nation has become one of the world powers that this extreme Western nation has become one of the powers of the extreme East. Now, this nation of the farthest West has itself become one of the kings of the East. Now, when the ways of the kings of the East shall be prepared, it will be prepared for this nation with all the others. For this nation is now one of the kings of the East. Now, when the ways of the kings of the East shall be to gather to the battle of the great day of God Almighty, this great nation must be gathered among them. For this nation is now one of the kings of the East with the others. Now, the interesting controversies and entanglements of the Eastern question include all the kingdoms of the world that are upon the face of the earth. And when the crisis comes and the wrath of God is poured out, all nations drink it. All nations come up to Armageddon. All nations join in the battle of the great day. And now all things are ready for the drying up of the great river Euphrates. All things are ready for the way of the kings of the east to be prepared. Now, one thing we can say here is that uh, Uriah Smith's understanding of the eastern question isn't exactly the same as A.T. Jones, right? Now, this is, of course, before Weir. Is Jones following Miller's rules here in his arguments to say that America is one of the kings of the East? So one is Louis F. Weir teaches that the way of the kings of the East is a reference to Cyrus, who is the Lord's anointed, right, the Messiah. He's a type of Christ, and that the, that the kings of the East is a reference to Christ's second coming, right? So that there is this, we'll call it spiritual or figurative application. So you take the story of the fall of literal Babylon, and we apply it in Revelation to the fall of spiritual Babylon. So the drying up of the river Euphrates is that reference. The kings of the east, that's going to be Cyrus and Darius, who are going to come and cause Babylon to fall. Is that Does that make sense, the way that we understand this? Is he making a literal application there somehow? That so we're, he's, he, he's making a, more a literal application, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it, it is, it's actually a mixture of literal and spiritual. So when we look at Revelation 16, right, you, you're going to have 16, 17, and 18 are actually all part of the same story. Um, I mean, we could actually really go back and say, you know, when we, uh, you know, when we when we look at these this story where it's going to talk about the seven last plagues. You know, you're going to have the three angels' messages, and then you're going to have the chap, the seven last plagues mentioned, the seven bulls of wrath, right? The fall of Babylon, right? All all of these things are connected. They're all part of the same prophecy. Dealing with this, I mean, people could even argue. Really, we go back uh, to Revelation 12. So the first ones are going to be dealing with, you know, the churches, the seals, and the trumpets, right? And then you're going to have in chapter 12, they're going to start dealing with these beasts, the seven, seven heads, 10 horns, right? You're going to have the great red dragon. Then you're going to have the papal beast, right? Then you're going to have this uh, message of 144,000 and the three angels messages, right? And then you're going to have these seven last plagues. And, and that way that I look at it is this is like a three one combination. You have the set first group of three sevens, and now you have the seven last plagues. The seven last plagues are, are addressing at the end of the world where the other ones are dealing with, uh, with Rome, right? So Eastern and Western Rome, et cetera. So that dealing with that earlier history, seven last plagues, all of this is going to address at the end of the world. Anyway, when we when we get here to um, the sixth plague, right, we know the plagues are after the close of probation. In spite of what Thiel tries to argue that that Weir is putting them before the close of probation, he's not. He's just misreading Weir. But when the sixth angel poured out uh, his vial upon the great river Euphrates and the waters thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared, We must understand this in the context of Cyrus when he conquered Babylon, right? 
I saw three unclean spirits like mouth, like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. We know that these are symbols, right? So we're not gonna we're not gonna take you know actual uh, dragon and actual beast, right? So there's some quotes. Uh, should I read these quotes that you're posting there, Stephen? Um, yeah. So this just relates to uh, what I was uh, saying concerning your asthma. Okay. So May 13th, 1862, under the title "Will the Pope Remove the Papal Seat to Jerusalem?" refers to the purpose the papacy. So it's your Uri- Uri Smith editorial in May 13th, 1862. So the, the title is Will the Pope Remove the Papal Seat to Jerusalem? Refers to the papacy as the power of Daniel 11, verse 45. He quotes a statement from the Liverpool Mercury in which it is stated uh, that a certain plan was underway, which points to the realizing of the Pio Nano uh, Nono's favorite plan of removing the seat of the papacy to Jerusalem. This is commented on by Uriah Smith as follows. It is, is not the above item significant taken in connection with Daniel 11, verse 45. Um, what does SSDP stand for, Stephen? That's the uh, Seventh Day Press. So this is the, the website of yeah, uh, so Adventists. I think they're based yeah. in Canada. And they promote Uriah Smith's view. And then they replied... It was a common view in the right movement. So I was just trying to get the idea that, say, the, the Miller, uh, that Uriah Smith he understood the papacy, was the, the King of the North in, in 1862. Yeah. And then they reply, it was a common view in the right movement. The message focuses on the development of, sorry, this message focuses on the development of this subject in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then it mentions the Seventh-day Adventist Church, as we know it was established in 1863. So <laughs> from out there, I get the sense that they're not looking further back than 1863 for the message for what uh, Daniel 11, which is 40 to 45, is about. Yeah. Now, now, I've run into this idea, so that's why I kind of giggled. So there are people who really believe that Once the church became a denomination in 1863, that's where we we have this dividing line between uh, the errors of the past and and the truth of the present. It sort of reminds me of like the churches of Christ that, uh, you know, uh, don't accept anything before the cross as truth, just stuff after the cross. So the New Testament, not even all of the New Testament. Um, only the New Testament, because uh, even the words of Jesus are before the cross, right? Um, they take. They also take exception with Paul. A lot the of churches, times, like, uh, with some Christians, you know, they say. Yeah, oh yeah, but Paul I'm just causes... specifically talking about the churches of Christ. That's a denomination. Okay. The churches of Christ, uh, but um, they're the ones. They're the most extreme that I've seen in that sort of separating the new covenant from the old covenant. But, but you know, we can't really do that. We can't say 1863 because the church organized. And now that since then, the doctrines are sort of crystallized and we can't depart from those because the church was Laodicean. But the reason that it organized was because of its failure, right? The, the church, it wasn't meant that the church would become an organization in that manner that that was the result of insubordination as far as i can see so but but the argument that that smith because he he believed something different at one time and now he believes it differently later i i guess maybe not so much crystallized because obviously probably in 1863 he still would have thought the same so they would have said that new light came since 1863 on the Eastern question, which then was a revival of Josiah Lich's understanding uh, to some degree, but with some new modifications. It it is pretty problematic to take that position. But going back here to this uh, Revelation 16, so we are to understand that this is 
using stories from the past, using types and applying it, right? So the drying up of the river Euphrates, we, we would need to look at when is the river Euphrates dried up? And that's in the story of Cyrus, right? And the kings of the ace there are Cyrus and Darius. So to me, this is a direct reference to that event, to the fall of literal Babylon. And so we're going to see this fall of spiritual Babylon as first she's going to be introduced here as this great prostitute, right? And then finally the fall of Babylon, right? And again, this is in a repeat and enlarge, right? It's going to go over the same ground and add more details. Does that make sense to people? Uh, the repeat and enlarge part? Well, the repeat uh, and enlarge part, and plus that when it talks about in the sixth plague, that it's referring to an a, an analogy or a uh, it's referring back to that line, to the fall of literal Babylon, and using those figures for the fall of spiritual Babylon. So yes. the dry, the great river Euphrates is not about the river Euphrates. Yes. And the kings of the east can't be kings of the east on this world. It can't be people from Persia or whatever, right? It must be referring right. to Christ's second coming because Christ. So this is this is what Lewis F. Weir says is that we we take what was lo local and literal. And as we apply it at the end of the world, it becomes universal and spiritual. Not mystical in the sense of, you know, you know, ethereal or something that's just like magical. Right. It's just it's just a figurative interpretation. We take this as a figure. Right. And so when we have the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. Well, that's Revelation 12, 13, 12 and 13. Right. The false prophet being the two horned beast, the beast being the papacy, the seven heads and ten horns, the leopard-like beast, and then the dragon being the dragon of Revelation 12, the seven heads and ten horns, but the great red dragon representing uh, pagan Rome, right? So, so we can see that these symbols have already been explained. They're symbols to, to mix the literal and the symbol, to take that the kings of the east must be referring to some military powers on this earth doesn't really make sense right so this battle of the great day of god almighty which we call the battle of armageddon verse 16 it it's in between that is we have the words of christ behold i come as a thief blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame so the context here is not about some literal battle, but about a spiritual battle, right? That is, during that time, the time of Jacob's trouble, God's people are given some admonition from Christ to keep their garments, right? So this battle is a spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. yeah, now, this is something that we understand. This is what we believe. Theo is attacking this whole idea. And he's saying that, that this idea comes from Lewis F. Weir and that it's a satanic idea, basically. It's caused all this confusion and that we need to go back to a more literal interpretation. Now, what, what, of course, he can't interpret everything literally. He, he has to understand some symbols, but he's going to restrict how many things we can take as symbols. So we're going to have to take certain things as literal because he believes that Daniel 11 is literal and that we have to fit that in. Right. So obviously he's going to place the, the plagues after the close of probation. But if we have a, a literal battle, how is that even relevant after the close of probation in this context? Right. The, the whole point of this conflict, if you read in the great controversy, is God's people who have had their sins blotted out and they can't bring them to remembrance and, and the trial that they go through, which she calls the time of Jacob's trouble, right? This, this is 
and, and Satan's going to personate Christ in this period as well. So, so they're going to have basically nothing to cling to except Christ. Nothing in themselves that they can see as good. It's going to appear just like Jesus when he was uh, in the wilderness and Satan comes to him. If thou be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Ellen White says it appeared as if he was the fallen angel, right? That is Christ. That is Satan was trying to imply you are the fallen angel. I need to, to see whether you are indeed Christ or, um, you know, Satan, right? Basically. And Jesus, of course, didn't appeal to his senses. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We've done that study before, dealing with the 40 days in the wilderness or of Christ compared to the 40 years that they were fed with manna. So for me, this is how I understand the scriptures. I, I, I can't accept Thiel's interpretation because it undoes so much of what we know to be true. And, and so that becomes a major problem. Now, we always have to be willing to examine what we believe. Now, the, the thing that we will do tomorrow is we will read one of uh, Weir's articles. So we'll just kind of see what Weir actually is saying. And we might not read a whole article. We'll, we'll see how much we do of that. But we do need to establish whether what we believe is true or not. And, and I think that this was... Uh, a good series uh, of studies to go through, to go through field studies. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today and for each person. And again, for all of the blessings and the way that you're working in our lives. Uh, we need you, Lord, and we need your guidance in what we are to do in our lives. Thank you for all the things that... Um, you have shown us through the years, help us to be corrected and to live up to that light that you have given us, that we can rejoice in that light, help us to not just acknowledge intellectually, but to experience in our life uh, the power that, and the light that you have shown. Watch over us and take care of us and bring us together again to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.